Hi everybody, my name is Brady and I'm a 19th century American historian and we are back with another React video and today we're going to be continuing Mr. Beat's American presidential election series with the election of 1844. I know a lot of people aren't interested in this part of American history, but we're doing this anyway. I'm interested. You can't jump from the founding or even Andrew Jackson to the Civil War. It just doesn't work that way. You need the Mexican-American War at least. And we have to talk about James K. Polk, who is, in my opinion, though I don't know how you could dispute this, one of the most successful presidents in American history. And by success, I mean he had an agenda, he had a handful of things he wanted to do, and he accomplished pretty much everything. Only served one term and walked away. It's not that he couldn't get reelected, he chose not to because his first term was so thorough. So, deserves a little bit of credit on that one. How many presidents do we have that made big promises and didn't follow through on any of them? You could probably count it on a few hands, at least. Um, so, I'm excited about this one. Let's get it started. Mr. B presents... Presidential, presidential elections, elections in American, American history. history. The 15th presidential election in American history took place from Friday, November 1st to Wednesday, December 4th, 1844. This was the last presidential election to be held on different days in different states. All future presidential elections would be held on a single day. President John Tyler had taken over after William Henry Harrison died, but he remained at odds with the Whig Party. Yeah, if you didn't watch the previous one, I'm going to set a little bit of the uh, uh, the setting, I guess, here. John Tyler was the vice president for William Henry Harrison, who died about a month into his term. I talked about this a little bit in the previous one, but Harrison... He was going to be working a little bit more with his cabinet while John Tyler wanted his cabinet to work for him. So they had slightly different philosophies here. And John Tyler inherited the Harrison cabinet, which that's a thing. So they have these high expectations for the Harrison administration. Then they get Tyler and... They're not really fond of the guy. So he's one of the, I think, the only president to be basically disowned by his party, which is absolutely insane. He goes on to be kind of a Democratic Republican of old. Not exactly like a Jefferson, maybe a little bit more like a Monroe or Madison. I'm leaning towards Monroe here, but the comparisons aren't really perfect, so... Let's keep going. The Whig Party actually stopped supporting him, and so did the Democratic Party, his old party. At odds with both of the major political parties in the country, he tried to start a third party movement for re-election, hoping that many who agreed with him on the annexation of Texas would support him. The Texas annexation issue would divide not only the country, but the Democratic Party. Martin Van Buren, originally a shoe-in for the Democratic nomination in 1844, was against the annexation of Texas. This is a huge issue here, and why don't they want Texas? Well, Texas just broke off of Mexico, so to bring Texas into the American Union would almost definitely cause a problem with Mexico. How bad is it going to be? Who even knows at this point? If you're in this perspective here, who knows how bad this could be? Uh, the Mexican-American War tends to be pretty dominant on the American side, so that's a thing here, but there's a lot of people who just don't want that conflict. Then there's like the slave balance here. It's probably going to come in as a slave state, so a lot of Northerners are already a little bit skeptical about letting in new states without having another non-slave state to balance that out because all the slave states they're gonna vote together on stuff and all the free states they're gonna vote together on stuff generally little exceptions here and there uh 
but that's kind of always how they've maintained balance here. So to bring in Texas, that's going to be a huge monkey wrench into the system. So they're going to have to really work with that. However, many influential Southern Democrats like John Calhoun and Andrew Jackson wanted Texas. At the and Andrew Jackson's opinion still matters. Uh, we don't really like him a lot these days, even though he's still on the money. Uh, but his opinion really mattered at the time. People loved Andrew Jackson. He's one of the most popular presidents ever in his own time. Like, he, he's, like, I'm not going to say he was on Washington levels, but he was one of those guys who transcended regular popularity. He was beyond that. What he represented was uh, a whole democratic ideology to the people. So his opinion matters. And him and Van Buren differing is going to be a big deal because you know who he's not going to differ with? James K. Polk. And you know who James K. Polk is? The guy who's going to win this election. Democratic Spoilers. National Convention, three nominees were discussed at first. Van Buren, James Buchanan, a senator from Pennsylvania, and Louis Cass, the ambassador to France. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, came James Polk, a former governor of Tennessee and former speaker of the House. Though Polk had originally entered the convention hoping to be the vice president nominee, by the end of the convention, he was the most popular guy in the room, getting the nomination unanimously. Polk and the unanimously thing, thats that usually comes from a lot of people changing their vote. Uh, a unanimous vote was very important. Uh, when it came to picking a nominee. So even after it's basically decided, a bunch of people will be like, okay, so we all have to be together on this. Okay, I'll switch my vote for Polk just so we can have a unanimous vote. That was very important here. Uh, I think Polk running for vice president, um, well, lobbying for himself to have a vice presidential position, I, I think uh, that was very important. He's essentially arguing to be everybody's second pick uh, everybody's second favorite and that's not a bad position to be in because if you have a few candidates in the field and you can't get the necessary amount of votes to decide on any of them people will start looking at their second pick that guy so it's really smart now that if, if, if I don't know, I don't think he had any expectation for actually being president this early, maybe eventually. But uh, I, I think this I caught everybody by surprise. But if he really was thinking that far through, he's smarter than I even give him credit for. And I tend to give him decent credit famously became the first well-known quote dark horse candidate meaning before the election he was not well known george dallas a former senator from pennsylvania was nominated as polk's running mate the Ooh. fact that the city of dallas texas was named after him might be a hint as to who would win the election mm -hmm. the Whig party was firmly against texas annexation after abandoning john tyler the party went back to the original Whig and yeah, John Tyler, he's setting a lot of this in place for Polk. Um, this conflict's going to be right around the corner. The second Polk really steps in, it's on. So uh, John Tyler doesn't get any credit at all. Maybe because there's like one good book on the guy. Uh, as far as history goes, his story has barely been told. You can at least find some decent books on James K. Polk. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 it, it's very weird. Some of the really absurd, over-the-top characters of this time, you're, sh you're shocked when you start to learn about them that they aren't considered popular in American history with all that a lot of them have done. That, that's the weird thing about this little limbo between Jackson and the Civil War. Henry Clay, who was pretty much abandoning John Tyler. Oh, perpetually almost president Henry Clay is back again. 
the party went back to the original wig, Henry Clay. Of course. It was pretty much the leading wig ever since the party began. Though Clay had run before for president and lost, uh, he lost three times, actually. Things seemed to be going more his way this time, as he could appeal to both southern slave owners who didn't want to annex Texas because it might make their land less valuable and slaves more expensive, and northerners who didn't want slavery to expand further west. In 1840, the Whigs did quite well with Harrison, and with Clay, they just assumed it would be another blowout. The Whigs nominated Theodore Freelingheisen, a former senator from New Jersey, as Clay's running mate. Things got a little mm. more complicated when John Tyler dropped out of the running for re-election and threw his support to Polk. Also, the abolitionist... Ooh, yeah, that is a big deal here. And obviously, they agree on annexing Texas, so that's a huge deal. Maybe the Whigs shouldn't have been so mean to Mr. Tyler. Maybe they would have been okay. I mean, he didn't have crazy support like i said he was not that popular but any sitting president throwing his support behind you it's probably going to be a positive especially if you're pulling from the other side a little bit more here you might have some wigs some tyler wigs actually go to the democrats in this case Liberty Party ran James Burney again. His support had oh, grown the Liberty since Party. 1840, and some worry that Northern Whigs might vote for him instead of Clay. So Clay was confident he would win at first, but as the election drew nearer, Polk's support had grown. Polk was all about manifest destiny, or the belief that it was the United States' destiny to expand from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Polk... This all... <laughs> America has these traditions. We have, like, American exceptionalism that America is, like, inherently better and stuff like that. It's okay when we do it. We do a whole lot of that sort of stuff. That all... I would say it goes back to Manifest Destiny, but it goes back further. There was something already kind of built into the American psyche that allowed Manifest Destiny to take off as well as it did. But, yeah... We're spreading to that West Coast, whether you like it or not. And there's conflicts in, like, the Northwest with uh, the British, who still uh, have some claims up there. And Polk, he's going to get us land up there, too. Like, he is wildly successful. Like, I cannot emphasize that enough wanted to expand the country's border whenever and wherever possible and more and more americans seemed to agree with him polk called for not only adding texas but also california and oregon mm. territory the northern boundary of oregon which britain claimed as well was the latitude line of 54 degrees 40 minutes many of his extremist supporters used the slogan 54 40 or <laughs> in hopes yeah. that a polk presidency meant getting all of oregon and here are the results Manifest Destiny. And we're going to get kind of the borders of today. That, that's what ends up happening out of that. And we don't end up fighting the British again. So that that's probably a good thing. We can take Mexico. Mexico is fine. They, they, we, we got that one. I, I don't know if we were up for another fight with the British. However, geographically, I think this would have the British at a... Uh, uh, pretty significant disadvantage given the territory that they are defending is is further away than the territory that they were defending in the first uh in the first couple wars it was proving to be pretty popular so ultimately that was why james polk won narrowly defeating henry clay to become the 11th president of the united states polk received 170 electoral votes Clay received 105 electoral votes, although the popular vote was much closer, with Polk yeah. getting 49.5% and Clay getting 48.1%. 20% more Democrats came out and voted in this election compared to the 1840 election, while only 4% more Whigs came out. James Burney came in third and received 2.3% of the popular vote, a much better showing than the 1840 election. Mm -hmm. George yeah, Dallas became the 11th vice president in American history. This election was the only one in which the winner lost both his birth state and his state of residence. 
Polk lived in Tennessee, but was born in North Carolina, and he lost in both states. It was also the only presidential election in which both major party nominees were former speakers of the House. At age 49, James Polk was the youngest to become president up to that point in American history. Polk promised crazy. to serve only one term, and he went straight to work. Within a little over one year in office, Polk would get half of Oregon and be at war with Mexico over Texas after its annexation. Yep, so we have Polk who's going to start this war, and this war is going to build the reputation of the next president, Zachary Taylor. He's another one of those presidents who pops out of a military conflict, and, and this stuff happens without fail, seemingly. We have the American Revolution, gave us George Washington, we had the War of 1812, it essentially gave us Andrew Jackson, the hero of New Orleans. And here we have this conflict, which is going to give us Zachary Taylor. Zachary Taylor, not nearly as popular as the previous two, but we're going to be getting a little bit more into him pretty soon. Another president who's going to die in office. Um, yeah. I'll see you for the next election, buddy. Bye. It's got different music here. I like it. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, John Tyler, he's out of the picture. He's going to be around, and he's, uh, he's an interesting case, because when the Civil War comes around, which is going to happen within his lifetime, um, he's going to be in the South. Isn't that interesting? Because the, we, we don't have uh, any other examples like that. I don't think, do we? No, I don't think so. Yeah, John Tyler is going to be in the South during the Civil War. Isn't that kind of weird to think about? And it's fun to read some of like his writings during the time because to have a president of the United States essentially viewed in a lot of ways as a defector, um, I think that in itself is a, an amazing thing to look at. Um, but yeah. I don't think anyone's going to miss the guy. Uh, yeah, thank you for watching. We're going to be doing more of these every once in a while, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll see you next time, buddy. All right, later.